Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Błażej Kwaśniak. I'm working here in Wrocław as a DevOps in uh, COE uh, GCP, I don't know, build, whatever. And a bit of background for this presentation. So first of all, um, this presentation is kind of the outcome of the research which I've done for one of the customers. Um, the overall background of it was the customer would like to have serverless because it's a great buzzword and everyone loves buzzwords. But in, in the same side, they, they don't want to use any kind of managed service to have serverless. So we have to come up with some kind of ideas. Uh, all in, after all, it doesn't happen. I mean, we did not deploy it, but it's a different story. And second thing, and this presentation has been presented some time ago for the DevOps, uh, Rosa DevOps meetup, as you can see at the bottom. And that's why there are a couple of obvious things, because on those kind of meetups, they not there are not usually guys who are DevOps experts on some of this, something like this. So sorry for that, but you know, it how it works. And the last thing, um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm okay with that. Uh, it's no problem to me. So let's start. Uh, yeah, agenda. So first of all, what is serverless? Then we go to the kubeless, uh, some kind of marketing bull, <coughs> we know something, and Knative, what is Knative, and some questions. But as I mentioned, feel free to ask wherever, whenever you want. So some time ago, I found some kind of interesting um, comparison between pizza and different kinds of types of uh, group of services, like plasma service. And I'm trying to use it to describe what we are talking about um, today. So as you can see today, we'd like to do something like, um, let's imagine we have a Kubernetes, which is a kind of a platform as a service solution. Not necessary, um, it's kind of mixed, but let's, let's assume that today Kubernetes is pure platform as a service solution. And we would like to bring the function as a service capabilities on top of Kubernetes. Of course, someone would, might, would like to ask, uh, what's the purpose of having Kubernetes managing this and having something different on top of it? What's the point? Don't ask me. As I said, a customer asked about this, so we did it. So what is serverless um, back then? Well, um, let's say one year ago, um, serverless as a word prepared, uh, become pretty famous, pretty well-known buzzword in the cloud world, the DevOps world, wherever. Um, some people might think that this is something like this. Then there is no servers, but it's not really true. Um, this is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, a part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation blog post, which is trying to describe what is serverless. For me, it's not the fully, I, I do not fully agree with this kind of uh, definition. Uh, why? Because as we can see here, um, we can, uh, there is something like uh, applications that do not require server management, which for me sounds tricky. Why? For example, if we have managed Kubernetes service, we do not manage service servers, but it's not being called as servers wherever. Um, of course, I'm going to share this presentation later, so you can go to sources, read, read the full, full article, um, wherever you want. So the current state of Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape um, regarding the serverless, as uh, so you can see at the bottom here. Um, Today, we are going to discuss this part of uh, the red, red box, uh, I mean, this part of the, this landscape. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of, I would say 15 or something like this, um, different installable services, which are considered as serverless stuff, um, which means there's a pretty lot of them. I was fully surprised. I was pretty surprised that there's that much um, products, technologies, you name it, that are considered as serverless which is interesting, this is most my personal opinion. So let's move on. Okay, um, kubeless, um, as I said at the very beginning, we were asked by a customer to provide some kind of serverless things. So we started from some kind of comparison, what are the real difference? Because as you can see here, as I mentioned, there's a couple of them and we choose couple, some, some part of it and try to describe. And based on that, I would, would like to just show you how it really works on the hood. I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware of how it really works. I mean, the serverless things on top of Kubernetes, but maybe it's worth it to show and to be, to be on the same page. 
So first of all, installation. As you can see here, I'm using Bro, which means I have a MacBook, but doesn't really change, doesn't really matter in this case. Um, installation is pretty straightforward. Uh, so you can see the whole kubeless thing is just a one pod on our Kubernetes uh, with three containers inside. Where one of them is Istio, but whatever. So installation is really really easy. Um, it takes a couple of minutes, and we have serverless on our Kubernetes. So next step, we have a function. Um, so you can see at the, at the top of this slide, um, there's a pretty easy and short function written in Python, which is going to just take an event. Why it's called the event, I have no idea. Um, but they're going to take an event and then return the data which are inside of it. Um, so let's try to use kubeless CLI um, to deploy it. It's also more than easy, I would say, really easy. Um, uh, then it takes a couple of minutes, we have our function deployed. And as you can see, we can use curl. Uh, of course, probably under the hood, I've got telepresence being run, but whatever. Um, we can use curl to just query our function. So as you can see, within 10 minutes, we can have function being deployed without any kind of sophisticated Kubernetes manifest, etc. And it works and um, sounds really cool. I mean, for me, it was really surprising that I can handle that in, well, 15 minutes, something like this. Just to add uh, some couple of words here uh, regarding the other tools which we evaluated, like OpenFast, OpenWiz, probably something like this, it was pretty safe for us as well, so cool. And then I was trying to see how it works under the hood, because usually I'm guy who is curious how the things are being done. So let's do it. As you can see here, um, we have a service, um, the standard Kubernetes service. Um, then we have deployment, of course, and the pod. Inside this pod, um, let's see what's inside this pod. I did some kind of reverse engineering. As you can see, we're using the cat, um, cat command, really cool. And then um, at the very, at very end, I just compare the checksum of the file. As you can see here, my file, which is inside this uh, pod, and my file on my local list has the same checksum, which means um, what kubeless is, being done, is, is doing, it's literally just copying your data, putting this into some pod, um, and then just run it, okay? There's no really magic under the hood. It's, it's really easy. Some other, other uh, solutions works in pretty same way. I would say there's no magic. We need pod to be deployed nevertheless, wherever. So now we are going smoothly to Knative because the main topic of the presentation is, uh, is Knative is going to change the world. And so let's maybe start from the brief description how Knative is different. Um, because so far we, I didn't mention Knative at all. How Knative is different and what is the purpose of Knative being built by some companies? Um, so, as you can see here, there's a four companies who are founding or were the initial members of the, let's call it Knative organization. Um, there are three, at least three big companies like Google, Red Hat, IBM. And now I have, there's a question why those three companies would like to come up with some different, yet another um, several solution. What is the purpose? What is the idea? And how they would like to earn money on that? Um, because, well, guys, let's be let's be honest. It's all about the money, as usual. So a bit of marketing. As you can see here, this uh, slide comes from the Google Cloud. Um, so this part is pretty, um, not interesting, but important to understand. How how Google is trying to sell to sell Knative, and how is the, what is the difference between Knative and some other uh, some other um, several solutions in cloud native computing foundation landscape? So um, they would like to sell it as a, some kind of framework, I would say, framework which is supposed to be uh, to give you a possibility to build several solutions on top of it which means they, they provide you a set of primitives, and I'm gonna show you later how it's working, how it's supposed to work. Um, based on that, you should be able to build some serverless uh, workloads on top of Knative, and probably be able 
to migrate it. So for me, this sounds a bit like a Kubernetes because, okay, Kubernetes is great, you know it, um, but please keep in mind that having the abstraction laid like a Kubernetes is allowing you as a user to easy, probably, in theory, sorry, in theory, easy migrate your stuff from one cloud provider to another. So sounds like uh, Google is supporting for me. Looks like uh, Google was at the very end just come up with Kubernetes and then they're supporting it a lot because they would like to, to have a new customers because if someone using Kubernetes on AWS, it's much easier for them to move to GCP. So Knative is from in my personal opinion and looks like I'm, it's, it's true. Um, some different and yet another I'll try or whatever to just take some customers from AWS. So some more human relatable definition, it comes from medium.com, uh, I mean the blog post of some guy. As I said, Knative, it's pretend to be some low level API, also level building blocks as being described here um, to allow people to have the serverless workloads on top of it. And I'm gonna show you how it's being built. So if you would like to um, build or prepare some kind of fancy diagram, it would look like this. We have a Kubernetes, we install Knative, and on top of this Knative, we should have some functional service platforms. And as we will see next, I mean, we will see later in the next slides, it's not really true in my personal opinion, because using the pure Knative building blocks, you can also deploy um, several, I mean, just in container slots with your functions. But this was the initial idea, as as far as I know, um, they are still want to do it in this way. So another, yet another marketing slide. As you can see, Red Hat, even one year ago, almost one year ago, um, they were announcing some kind of Knative, etc. The last one, I mean, the last news, the latest cloud run from Google is also based on Knative, as you can see. So this means that more or less, um, this idea is going to bring back to life. I mean, they would like to make it real. The idea of having just a founding layer or um, uh, some kind of base serverless stuff and let people move from one cloud to another, which means take customers from AWS and move it back to Google Cloud. And another IBM slide, um, yeah, again, they deploying, I mean, they're providing some services based on Knative to let people use their cloud. And I found some kind of interesting slide, um, some presentation, the source on the bottom from Cisco, which means Cisco is also interested in Knative. Um, as you can see on the left side, Knative is really low level stuff. And that's why probably um, the idea behind that, as I mentioned, is probably that, you know, all of those things on the right side should be based on Knative and having that, uh, we have some kind of common APIs, common framework to let people move and, you know, to be more like, uh, more elastic in this way. So finally, some technical stuff, um, Knative deep dive. So let's go. Knative itself has a three main components, um, serving, built and eventing. I'm gonna describe briefly all of them, um, but a few words. Serving is nothing more like, uh, uh, how to deploy your pod and manage that. So under the hood, they're leveraging kind of interesting technologies starting from Istio, et cetera, um, just which are supposed to help your pod to run, to be up and running and scale up and down, et cetera. Build, um, just build the containers, which means the Knative itself is allowing you to have a fully working chain of your starting from building container, deploying the container, and then probably monitoring, etc. Which means uh, build is just, you know, build a container like Docker build and so on. For that purpose, they're using Kanika, uh, some another Google uh, service to build containers. And the last one, the last but not least, is eventing. And in my personal opinion, this one is the most interesting one, this whole uh, stuff. Because what is eventing? Um, eventing. Uh, the idea behind that, uh, I didn't mention it so far. The idea behind that is to build some kind of a layer on top of uh, message bus like Kafka. 
which means currently if you have microservice, your microservice is connecting to your Kafka instance, for example. So most likely your microservice should uh, be written in that way that is capable of consuming, for example, messages from Kafka. So which means if you'd like to switch from Kafka to, I don't know, um, PubSub or Google, some Google service or AWS service, you should change your microservice. And eventing in this way is building another layer on top of kind of eventing solutions. And having that, you don't need to change your code, the code itself, because your code should work with eventing itself. And under the hood, you have everything to work with any, in theory, any kind of the message bus system. So as I promised, serving. Um, serving is most the, the easiest one, in my personal opinion. As you can see, there's a lot of interesting capabilities. Most of them is coming from the Istio. Uh, for, those, for all of those who are uh, familiar with Istio and how Istio works, um, it's pretty straightforward that having something deployed with Istio, you can manage your routes and do, you know, manage different versions of your services, uh, do some kind of traffic shifting, shaping, sorry, etc. So, nevertheless, I mean, all in all, um, serving is capable of deploy pod, set up a proper configuration in terms of monitoring, um, in terms of ECO, as I mentioned, set up proper services in, in Kubernetes, and then manage that. Which to me sounds like a, cool, a pretty nice tool to just reduce our workloads, because instead of you know, writing the deployment uh, manifest file, then uh, writing or templating some kind of Istio uh, rated manifest, etc. We can use this um, to deploy everything and it should be pretty easy. And it is because I tried. So, um, this is the um, some easy, I mean, some basic example of uh, manifest how to deploy a service using serving or native. As you can see here, we have a different API, um, which means that the serving is being built based on custom resource definition Kubernetes, which are becoming pretty famous currently in Kubernetes world. So it's, it's good. I think this is the idea is good here. And what we really need here is just a container which we'd like to deploy. It's that simple. I mean, having that file, uh, we are de deploying our container. And also we have Istio being configured, all the services, deployments, and other things, right? Kubernetes things are being configured for us. Also, probably as far as I'm maybe Jagger even, etc., uh, which sounds cool. How to manage auto scaling? Um, um, probably I forgot to mention that. Kubernetes, uh, Knative itself is also doing auto scaling uh, based on a Metcast, uh, horizontal pod auto scaler, and other solutions. So as you can see also with one, uh, one manifest, serving Knative serving manifests, we're able to just configure auto scaling out and it just works as I tried. So as I mentioned, the good point is on top of Kubernetes, we have some other abstraction layer which gives us flexibility and gives us, sorry, reduce the amount of work which we have to do. It's cool. So how to manage routes in serving? Um, this looks exactly how, may not exactly, but pretty similar how, how the uh, Istio is being done. I mean, we have to define some kind of versions, define the percentage of traffic, and then do it. As far as I remember, uh, Knative is also supporting different kind of um, traffic shifting, also some automatic way to do it. There's, there's also automatic way to do it. So for those who are familiar with Istio, it's pretty straightforward how it works. And some fancy graph from OpenShift. This is the end-to-end -end graph, how to use serving, um, including build. I'm gonna mention build later, I mean, soon. So as you can see here, uh, we just, you know, create an image, then deploy it, push it somewhere. Because okay, Kentucky also push, is uh, supporting pushing images to some external registry. And then using the uh, native Kubernetes things like services, etc., cetera, uh, we just deploy it and it works. Um, so build, uh, everything, which is build, 
build is a service who is allowing you to be, which is allowing you to build your containers on the Kubernetes cluster, as I mentioned, using Canico for that. And the most interesting thing, in my personal opinion, it also supports steps, which means in theory, we can build some kind of CI CD pipeline um, using the steps and this build service. Things like I saw some examples with like uh, run, let's uh, run the unit test, run integration test, then do some kind of other magic with this, like in GitLab, for example. So this build is pretty powerful, I would say, and looks interesting, in my personal opinion. And as I mentioned, it's using Kaniko to build images, but I'm not sure if it matters in this, way, in this point. In this point. So again, um, some definition, how to use build. Um, um, again, custom source definition, also which is also pretty um, straightforward. Uh, here, the most interesting part, source. We can use Git and just put the Git repository and the branch, which means uh, it's nice because we don't need to do any other magic. It supports cloning, etc. I have no idea how it works with, for example, SH keys, etc. But I hope it works. At least it should. And here. Uh, just like that. I mean, we don't even need um, to add some kind of Docker file. We just need to add some kind of uh, base image, which means it's even easier to prepare a Docker file. As far as I know, it also supports Docker files, but you know, in this way, it's even easier. So no magic as usual. And as I mentioned, eventing, the most interesting one in my personal opinion and the most complicated one uh, so as I said, eventing is supposed to be an abstraction line on top of some message message brokers, uh, which looks pretty cool because we don't need to stick to one of them and we can easily switch in theory, of course. So um, this here we can see the four most uh, the four four basic um, items. Like I mean, maybe not items, but sorry. Um, things which are pretty pretty important is eventing solution. Um, the names are pretty self-describing, like source, consumer, etc. This thing sounds like a pure eventing bus, which we can see, which all of us are aware of, probably. But the abstraction on top of it is pretty nice. And here I'm going to show you how it works. Um, so eventing, again, custom resource definition. And here um, we are using GCP as a source. We, I mean, pops out from GCP as a source. How it works? Here we define a topic, which is testing, and the channel. Um, we described before channel is kind of a word which uh, exists in Knative world. Uh, uh, so it describes the place, the contact point for your thing for your services. Uh, uh, to get data from or to, to push data to. So on the right side, we need to, this channel has to be defined and on the left side, we're just using it, which means that uh, we're just gonna take a data from topic testing and this data are gonna be fed and gonna be put to channel called subtest. After that, uh, we need a subscription. A subscription, uh, again, is something like we defined who is subscribing to this channel. And so here we can see that subscriber is going to be message dumper. A message dumper is the name of the service here, being deployed by serving uh, Knative. And service is just, you know, just a pod with some kind of code inside. Um, so here we define the service. And on the left side, we need to say that this service is going to fetch data from this channel and the channel is being uh, connected to the PubSub itself. Here on the, on the bottom, you can see how to test it, how to push data, and then it just works. But what is the most interesting part if this, in this whole eventing? Uh, this is the code of the application which is deployed here. So as you can see, the transport layer is HTTP, which was a pretty surprising to me um, because I was expecting something more sophisticated. Um, it looks like Knative is just converting the messages from being the, you know, say Kafka message, which is a bit of a couple of bytes 
and then it just being converted to some kind of a HTTP request, which makes sense to me at some point. Uh, for example, we can do some kind of traffic sh shaping with uh, with Istio, etc. So it might probably make uh, some kind of sense. But honestly, I was pretty surprised that uh, it's that easy. And honestly, we do not deploy. We are not deploying application which is consuming data from in some binary format but we are using uh we are just you know deploying some http application with restful api probably so this was kind of a uh, interesting fact okay market adoption uh, because i think yeah sure regarding this uh, the channel subscriptions Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just wondering because you, you can put like this the source can be different as you said so mm -hmm. for example it's a pub sub from google mm -hmm. and this conversion to http how, how does this influence some of the, um, the payload that the source sends so the the, the receiver gets uh, like a unified uh, k native format or does it have to still care about the source of the message as far as you remember it was just like uh, uh you know j JSON file. I mean, in this in this request here, we can see uh, the JSON body content, and in this JSON you have all the fields being which are in the original message. Honestly, I haven't checked that deep. How is that different? For example, how it works when we put some kind of a binary items into our message, because it's also possible in theory. Should we encode it to base sixty four or not? Honestly, I have no idea. I just check it how it works. Some mm -hmm. basic use case, but I haven't go that far to be honest. So sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, sorry. So not exactly like uh, Knative internally uses a uh, cloud specification. So all messages like go using this specification and this format. So it's not just a JSON file or JSON okay. format. All right. So how is that different from the JSON? Is it like Avro, which is kind of JSON but different? It's it's like a JSON, but uh, like it should follow some uh, specification with like version. Uh, it should contain version. It should contain uh, uh like a lot of meta information and so on okay so so, so, so the end Vitali, Vitali, because my question was like let's let's connect you know uh, for example sns as a, yeah. as a source and sns says uh, of course this a strange payload that you have to go to get the body of the message so yeah you, it, it converts like this message with uh from sns to cloud specification which should contain uh like from which source, from which queue, and oh, so on. Okay, so and you always get a, co a common somehow dom domain object, common common object for every source. This, this. Yeah, right. Okay. Nice. Oh, so Thank thanks. You. I didn't know that. I, I heard about this cloud uh, message specification, something like this, but I haven't checked and I didn't notice that it's pretty the same. For me, it looks like JSON. So sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, market adoption. At the very beginning, I told that the kind of idea behind the Knative thing is to uh, is that this kind of framework should be used by other frameworks as a founding layer. As we can see here, um, the market adoption is pretty bad right now. OpenWhisk has some kind of whip. Uh, I'm not sure what the status, I haven't checked that. Also the Camel K was trying to, I even saw examples from Camel K. Um, for those of you who are not aware of, of what Apache Camel K is, it's like a integration frame library, I would say, which allows you to integrate different data source with different outputs, uh, different systems, maybe, it's a better, better word to describe it. And there's a kind of internal, I don't know, transform, whatever it is. So it sounds like a pretty cool thing for uh, serverless things, but as you can see here, there are some examples, but I'm not sure what is the status, is it being natively used or not. So market adoption, in my personal opinion, is pretty bad, but frankly speaking, I haven't checked it since two months, so maybe something has changed. So far, the reading, um, there are some links, probably most of them are being mentioned on the slides, and my personal biased opinion. Um, as I said, KNT looks interesting, but I'm not sure it's going to change something, and in my personal opinion, it's an interesting thing, and we should keep an eye of it, but uh, I cannot tell yes or no. I mean, is it going to change? Is it going to be a game changer or not, like Kubernetes was, in my opinion? So I have no idea what you think about this, um, but more or less, that's it for me, and the question time. Is there anyone who has any question? So 
silence means no. So thank you very much and thank you. And